Well, last week here we had kind of a peak experience, I would say. Uh, our bishop was in our midst, and for once the church was fully complete. Because when you have the bishop and the priests and the deacons and the lay people all together in the same place at once, nobody's missing. And we had a baptism and reaffirmed our baptismal covenant. And besides Elizabeth being baptized, uh, Ron and Carl and Carrie were confirmed, and Mark and Ann and Carrie uh, reaffirmed their baptismal promises along with all of us. We all went away full of the Spirit, feeling joyful and renewed in hope, a sense of the meaning and the possibility of life together in Christ. And I thought about that this week as I was reading from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, which begins with Jesus going up onto the mountain to pray to his God, to have his own kind of peak experience. And then he called to himself 12 of his disciples. He named them his holy apostles, Peter and Andrew and Thomas and James and John and all the rest of them. And then with his 12 disciples, the gospel says, Jesus came down from the mountain and he stood on a level place and a great crowd came to him. There's people from Judea and Jerusalem, which is to say Jewish people, and people from the coastlands of Tyre and Sidon, Gentiles, and there he healed, and power went out from him, and he drove out demons from those who were afflicted by those unclean spirits, and then he, as we read this morning, lifted up his eyes not to pray to God, but to look at his disciples and gave them his teaching, the constitution, if you will, of the community that he came to establish. Now, this teaching draws on an ancient tradition of teaching about what it means to be God's people, to be an elect people, to be a people called out from among the nations to live a special way of life, to be holy as God is holy. And that word holiness, in both its Hebrew and its Greek and its Latin etymologies, has a connotation of being set apart. Set apart for God's special purposes. So what does it mean to be a people set apart? as God's holy people, and to do so on a level place, in the middle of a mixed crowd of all kinds of 
suffering people right in the middle of overwhelming human need. Well, our readings today give us some suggestions about what kind of community we are, we are called to be. First of all, we are meant to be an apocalyptic community, which is to say that when the veil has been stripped away from the empires of the world, be they Greek or Roman or French or British or Russian or American, the veil, the mask of their supposed benevolence, their pretensions at being uh, ordained by God, and their legitimacy crumbles along with their power, We are what's left. We are what is revealed as what God was building in the world all along. A kingdom that belongs first and foremost to the poor. Not because they are poor, but because Poor people know that the world isn't finished. That God wants more from us. God must want more. If you're hungry, if you're weeping, if you're oppressed, you know that this can't possibly be the way that God wants the world to be. And it's those people for whom, if the kingdom isn't for them, it's not God's kingdom. It's also this community, a spiritual, mystical, messianic, cosmic community. It begins with God's purposes from the very beginning of creation. And its eyes are set on the fulfillment of what God has been doing for all things. How God will bring all things together in the end into perfect unity. In Christ in a person who is not simply a historical person, but a cosmic person, a spiritual person, a person who represents and embodies the power of God present in all things, but in particular in human consciousness and human experience. And we can experience that person. Paul prays for the church in Ephesus that their hearts will be enlightened with that spirit of wisdom and revelation to perceive the glory of what God holds out for us. If we don't forget to hope, if we don't settle for this present order of things under the rule of one or another of those bestial empires that the book of Daniel speaks about. But keep our eyes fixed on the kingdom that belongs to the poor. And this community as a radical commitment to God's justice. Radical because it goes to the very root 
of injustice. Which is not to say that it's based in some political ideology, some historical determinism, but it's based on seeing a person, seeing Christ in another person. Can we know God in each other? Can we transform our existing relationships? Can we go to the very root of wrong and injustice and allow God to call out of us the holiness that is love for one another? Because after all, what do we really want? That's the question at the heart of Jesus' teaching. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What do you really want from another person? Isn't it love? Isn't it acceptance? Isn't it to be seen, to be known, to be understood, to be forgiven, to receive patience and compassion and understanding? That's what I want. And I'm guessing that that's what you want too. That is what Jesus gave to people. Not just miracles of healing. Those were simply signs of something far greater, which is the knowledge that God loves you, that God understands you, that God has compassion for your suffering. That God understands the circumstances that lead us to sin against one another. And yet forgives us. Because God has infinite hope for God's people. And that is what Jesus showed his disciples. That's what led them to leave behind everything that they knew. To risk condemnation persecution, even torture and death for his sake. Because once you've experienced that, once you've known what a difference that can make in the world to know that and to offer it to someone else the way that Jesus offered it to people, there's no going back. There's no submitting again the false promises of the false 